Good afternoon and welcome to Western Growers Center for Innovation and Technology Tech Talk with our guest SWIM System. My name is Lisa Dobbins at the Center for Innovation and Technology here in Salinas, California. We will first have a presentation, then we will host Q&A from the live and webinar audience. For those of you on the webinar, please type in your questions and we will ask them of our panel after the presentation. We are welcoming a special guest here today, Dave Puglia, Executive Vice President of Western Growers. Dave joined Western Growers in 2005 as the lead of the organization's state government affairs team in media and communication. He has since been promoted to Executive Vice President responsible for Western Growers operations and his extensive work on water policy issues affecting Western agriculture. Welcome, Dave. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you everybody for joining the webinar today. Um, a little bit of quick background before I introduce our main speaker. We are approached at Western Growers, as you might imagine, by companies all the time offering solutions um, for various problems our members are presented with, maybe none more so than water quality and water supply problems. We were approached by SWIM over two years ago and began a process of due diligence to understand the offering this company presents and weigh that against the challenges our members are facing, especially in water supply and water scarcity. And after a long time and heavy examination, uh, we entered into an agreement with SWIM to help bring this offering to our members more quickly um, in the coming years. There were several key drivers of our confidence in what SWIM can offer. The first is around data. Water quality data and water supply data has become a premium for uh, members in our state as well as in Arizona. It's a must-have for different purposes, whether it's for incentive-based conservation programs or facil for facilitation of transfers and exchanges, implementation of the state's groundwater law, um, all of those things that are both opportunities and challenges for our members are reliant on highly credible, highly accurate data. The second is water policy reform, and in California especially, we've seen evolving or, depending on your point of view, devolving water policy as it relates to agriculture. We have interest groups that are dedicated to reforming the water right system in ways that could well be detrimental to farmers in the state. We have others who are thoughtful policy um, advocates who are arguing for a reform of the water rights system that doesn't fundamentally change water rights but instead replaces what we now have, which is a bureaucratic system that slows down water transfers, makes them difficult to achieve, with something that is closer to a fully functioning, transparent water market. If that day were to come, and it has come in Australia, which many people in California water discussions point to as the example, uh, then SWIM would play a very, very important role in facilitating a workable, transparent, functioning water market. And then finally, there is the, the matter of protecting farm communities from increasing pressure to move existing ag water supplies to urban and, and environmental uses. Um, SWIM allows our members to achieve a very, very highly accurate baseline of water use data that can protect their reasonable and beneficial use down the road. And again, this is a platform that only we think SWIM can, can meet. In a moment, you're going to hear from SWIM CEO Kevin France. Kevin now calls Denver his home, but he comes from a multi-generational farm family in Santa Maria, California. Before he even completed his MBA from the University of Colorado, he was involved in starting up internet companies and other ventures. It was his experience as a water broker in, in Colorado, witnessing the buy and dry transactions that left small rural communities like Crawley, Colorado, with little water and businesses closing up, that prompted Kevin to bring together others who wanted to find a better way to stretch that state's water without drying up entire farm communities, and that led to SWIM. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, the CEO of uh, SWIM System Limited, Kevin France. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Lisa. You're Appreciate the time today. Thank you for everyone that's joining us in beautiful Salinas, California. The uh, weather is beautiful out here. And uh, thanks to everyone that's joining us on the webinar as well. Uh, as Dave mentioned, I'm CEO of Swim System. I'm going to spend a little bit of time here chatting high level about the product that we've developed. I'm then going to turn the baton over to our Chief Project Engineer and Water Engineer, Darren Fillmore, who's out of our Southern California office currently, who will be joining us on the webinar to share a little bit about the technical side of the deployment specifically that we're executing upon in California. 
Uh, before I start, I do want to encourage everyone that's listening. Um, if you haven't yet already, please uh, join our email newsletter on our website at swimsystem.com. Uh, or you can look at our news feeds or uh, blog postings. We're also on Twitter at Swim System, uh, at Swim System itself. And, of course, I tweet as well personally if you want to hear a bit of my personal opinion at Kevin and France. Uh, we'll see uh, if you'd like to hear that or not at the end of the presentation. We'll see. So let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, we'll start with the big problem. There is competition for water needed by other users. We have municipal industrial, other ag users, and conservation uh, users that are all vying for this valuable resource. The problem, well I say it's the target, it's the problem, is the source of that water is, agri is agricultural water allotments. About 80% of that water is located in ag, uh, if you take into account both surface and uh, groundwater. We believe the solution for the problem is a holistic, scalable planning, management, compliance, and reporting tool set that starts at the field level and can scale all the way to the system. That's critical and that sets us aside from what anyone else is doing because it can provide each relevant stakeholder across that line valuable decision-making data real time and act as a communication link amongst all the counterparties. So who are those counterparties? Who they include? They include the growers, the landowner in some cases. The irrigation district uh, could include state or other compliance organizations. All of those folks have a role in managing the water resources, and you have a, you have a breakdown in, in the data exchange, and that's what one of the things we look to help solve. So, what is SWIM? We're your on-farm water account, basically. We provide an annual service, and a good way to think about this is we are like QuickBooks for ag water. Uh, and I use that as an example because people can get their arms around that. You know, QuickBooks is an accounting program. Account for your finances almost to the level and scale that we account for the, the crop water budget. But QuickBooks also has other service offerings, that payroll services, budgeting services, uh, uh, tax services, and you can bit and piece those together to your needs for your financial accounting and management. SWIM has the same offering. It's a full turnkey solution. You pick what you need, and then, and then you, of course, utilize that particular service offering for your operations. The technology was developed uh, with the help of the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, it uses off-the-shelf data sources, uh, and solves very quickly and pays for itself very quickly as well. Uh, SWIM includes software, limited in-field instrumentation, and remote sensing into one comprehensive package. There's two software programs specifically. One of them is called SWIM Planner. And it's basically a wizard. It's designed for farmers and irrigators to get their arms around the types of change practices that can be offered uh, to conserve water. It's designed basically to evaluate farm income and water usage at their most optimal. Uh, Swim Manager is designed to aggregate that data amongst uh, multiple different uh, swim uses, so multiple different fields, and allow for the planning, the management, and the reporting of that data. So we start with the concept and then we end up with the actual audited data. So the process that we use, believe it or not, we use kids, nine and 10 year old kids with tablets. So anytime you have a problem with your computer, we just send it to them and then they fix it. <laughs> that's, that's what I do. Actually, all the kids in our office are under 25. They, they fix all the systems. We do have adults, in all seriousness, that, that work on the, on the technology package. And, and what we do is we, we provide localized uh, planning and management routines for each region that we're in. So if we're in Imperial Valley of California, we're using local regionalized data so that the output is very accurate, it's not conceptual, it's action-oriented. We don't obviously use the same data in Imperial Valley that we use up in the Central Valley. That's all, that's all customized. So crop production functions, water use assumptions, et cetera, et cetera, are, are localized for the region. Uh, the tool set is set up as what we call, in, in a form, as what we call a willing to grow strategy. So we ask the growers to consider a myriad of change practices. They can decide what they want to change, what they want to leave the same, and then the model kicks out the best crop and water usage allocation for that particular scenario. The grower can run it one time, ten times, fifty times. They can refine it until they get it exactly the way they want it. They then upload it to the cloud where everything else sits these days, right? We gather that data and then aggregate it, and that's where we start the monitoring and reporting. We start tracking water use, water consumption, uh, and all elements of the crop water budget, and we're able to provide an auditable trail for our clients. 
What SWIM does, in essence, is it estimates and validates the crop water budget. Everyone who's growers here in the room and, of course, on the call know a historical crop water allocation. Uh, it's been the same for, for eons. Uh, the farm takes a certain amount of consumptive use water to grow crop and evaporate off the soil. Uh, then there's surface return flow and subsurface return flow off the field. What SWIM looks to do is to create a set-aside new bucket of saved consumptive use water that can either be leased, can be traded, could be paid for through incentive, incentives, whether it's the state offering a tax rebate or a payment to track that saved water. Uh, the incentive can vary, but the key here is, from SWIM's perspective, is we want to provide that tool that quantifies the water, protects the underlying water rights, so the growers can rely on it as they have for eons, but then can monetize the savings. So it's not just a gimme, it's something that they're actually incentivized to, uh, to, 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 to do. Um, SWIM is, this is another thing that sets us apart from the competition. We're hardware and data agnostic. That allows us to scale. So from this graphic that you can see on your screen, this is an example of some of the over-the-counter over equipment manufacturers that we use. We also use other data sets, so uh, remote sets data from Landsat, CMS, uh, weather stations we put in the ground to cross-reference against. Uh, and what, what we're ending up doing is we're, we're providing flow data, consumption data, what's happening to the crop. And we, we, we quality assure and quality control the data at every process. So the folks that provide data services generally give the data to the client and say, here you go. You, it's either good or it's bad. And if it's bad, you can't make decisions off of it. If it's good and it's comprehensive and you can see where every one of those sub counts are going, think about QuickBooks again. Think about where your money goes and the level of, of, of auditing you can do through an accounting package for your finances. That is the level of data accuracy we're getting to uh, with SWIFT. A little bit about the company. It was launched in 2010. Uh, we initially received some state and federal grant money, uh, and we also sp sponsored an independent advisory board that met once a month with uh, stakeholders from the federal government, state, and local uh, growers. Of course, yes, we actually did have growers in our advisory group. They actually used the system. We got input from actual growers, believe it or not. So this is, an, this is a tool set that actually is written for the farming community. The, the approach is vetted. We spent five years on a research site up in northern Colorado. Several PhDs and master's theses were written on the topic. And here's the key. Ag people are running the show. These are people that kick dirt. We go out to the field. These aren't guys and gals just sitting in the room. They, they, they do do this. They, they, they code. They create software code. But that's not all they do. They actually go out and meet with the farmer, meet with the irrigation district, meet with the stakeholders. And there's trust embedded in that which is important. The process is patented. Uh, USDA helped us uh, invent or co-develop the technology, and we're currently active in three states. This final slide, before I turn it over to Darren, pretty much outlines, and it really visualized, crystallized uh, what the other options out there are and why SWIM is doing so well right now uh, in the marketplace. If you can see on this slide, we start with uh, what I call a relative benefit curve, basically from zero to 100. It's not really a curve. But I guess it's a line. So <laughs> start referring to it as a relative benefit line. And it goes from 0 to 100. And at the bottom axis, the x-axis, you can see from 1 to 20. These are elements that co the competition, and in some cases not the competition, just swim only, provides as a value add to get around that water conservation solution. So you can see as you go down the line, I'm not going to name all of them, but we start with planning tools, engineering consultation, uh, one, multiple points of data, climatic data that's raw, that, that, that gives you some element, whether it's uh, relative ET or, or other elements, and then on flow, off flow, then all of this data coming together in one co uh, cohesive uh, package, then you have the reports, the calibration, quality checking. Obviously, SWIM is at the end of the line, and we're by ourselves here. We're lonely over here on number 20. <laughs> And there's a whole lot of other folks. There's, there's basically three sub-levels of competition. You have equipment manufacturers, you have remote sensing services, and you have consultation or consulting engineers. Those are the folks out in the marketplace doing bits and pieces of this. And they're all slammed up on the front end of that graphic. Uh, you have a lot of uh, ag tech companies, do, which are, that's a good thing, to have widgets that measure certain points of data. 
That's important to growers for a specific uh, application, but we're measuring very specific data to get around a crop water budget. So when we go and pull that data, we're pulling it, we're cross-referencing it against two to three sources in most cases, and again, we're quality, quality checking, quality assuring it uh, for our clients. So when they can walk up, they can, they can look at it almost to the degree of an audited financial statement. That's almost to the level that we're looking to get to. Um, even though there's not a true standard yet, that's where we're heading with the SWIM package. But you'll notice on here, I'll note that some of these red areas that are marked with these carrots, folks aren't even participating, and SWIM only offers it. Uh, for example, the USDA algorithm that's patented, so we'll have 18 years exclusivity on that. Uh, you move up the line, some folks aren't looking at off flow, tail flows off of the farm. Uh, we're now just getting growers asking us for, for that particular service. We started beta testing that about a year ago, and now that's becoming important because it's a part of the crop water budget. It's an analytic calculation that helps us get around exactly what's happening with the crop water budget. Uh, and then you have this long line from about 12 all the way up to 20 where SWIM's participating by themselves. And if you look at this for a moment, I think it's going to crystallize uh, very quickly why we're providing a service offering that really is bringing value to the marketplace. Uh, growers are accepting it, expanding their use of it after they use it on a pilot basis, and I think that speaks volumes. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over now to Darren Fillmore, who's on the line here from Southern California. He's our Chief Water Engineer and Project Manager. And uh, Darren, why don't you go ahead and take it away from here. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we're having a little technical difficulty on this end. I'm not seeing the most current slide. Advance to the next slide, please. Should be on. My apologies. Something something oh, changed here. So you have the uh, swim enabled farm graphic, Darren. All right, I'll, I'll pull up an independent copy on my end. I think I lost the internet at the least opportune moment. It's always how it is. I'll uh, I'll start to chat about it here, Darren, while you're pulling it up. Um, this graphic. Uh, crystallizes for me in one picture uh, what SWIM brings to the party, some of the data that we gather from the field uh, to get to that crop water budget uh, uh, data stream, if you will, for our client. Uh, we're measuring flow data, we're measuring weather climatic data, uh, we're measuring other elements throughout the field that are, that are uh, field specific, determining on, determined, determined upon where the location uh, is base, and that data is all acquired through the cloud. And of course, we're also gathering not only on-farm data, but we're also gathering remote sense data. In many cases, satellite data and comparing and contrasting against uh, uh, flow data in the field. In some cases, we use low-altitude aerial flights where we need to, uh, although th those sites are now diminishing more and more as time goes on. Bottom line, we're balancing that crop water budget very much like you would balance your checkbook at the end of the month. That's the level of data we're getting. Darren, are, are you uh, hooked up? There? Kevin, thank you. Ahead. i got to work around working now. Good man. Go ahead and take it. Folks As are Kevin was with... mentioning from the cartoon graphic here, you can see the different flow paths that we examine and monitor to develop a water balance. And What really attracted me to swim when I joined the company a little over a year ago was the fact that it's a field-specific water balance and they, it's a complete water balance with each of the flow paths monitored. And that really helps. In in making a defensible water conservation calculation or a defensible uh, baseline calculation for your on-farm water use field by field. Next slide, please. So after we monitor each of those various flow paths, and that can be tailored to the specific farm, as Kevin mentioned earlier, you may not need tailwater monitoring, you may not have any tailwater, or it may not matter. Uh, delivery monitoring or, or water applied can be monitored in ET. Depending on the source, we may get evapotranspiration directly from fields on your farm or surrounding farms, or we may get it from regional sources. So it, it is tailored to each specific site, and we analyze your specific site and determine what fits best there. On this next slide, monitoring and reporting, it talks about uh, the various 
made means by which we provide this data back to the grower. And it can be, again, custom tailored to the needs of the individual grower or stakeholders involved in the, in the water budget process. It can be as detailed as needed. It can be, as noted here, near real-time data down to the minute or often more useful after an irrigation event or after the whole growing season or weekly or monthly summaries. But it will allow you to examine each individual flow path and then see the whole the whole picture. Next slide, please. And that hey, whole picture is what's shown here. Are, are you on the comprehensive re uh, reporting slide? I'm on comprehensive reporting. Okay, that's where you're at now. Thank you. As I mentioned, the whole picture is what's shown here in the bottom right. The way I prefer to look at this data is as a in a graphical format, and you can see the the background, the the lighter green color. And, the top line is how much water a given site used historically, and then below that, how much of that was needed for the crop in the dark green, and then what was actually delivered during our monitoring season, and where surface return flows fall on the bottom. And you also see that in tabular format in the various pages of the report, what we've got snippets of here. But what it allows you to do is, for your own purposes or for anybody looking on, to verify your efficiency. It allows you to analyze each flow path and see where there's need for improvement or where improvements have been made and to have a verifiable and validated water balance. Uh, next slide, please. A couple of slides here. This one and a few beyond it. Some pictures of what we're doing in various parts of California now as part of a pilot program we've been running for nearly a year now in our expansion to California. The first one in California is Imperial Valley. Uh, in Imperial Valley, we're monitoring crop water budgets on several fields, several thousand acres. And as you can see there, it involves some equipment around various parts of the field. In the center lower part, of the center lower photo on this slide, you see some gadgets sticking off a old slide gate. Now those gadgets are ultrasonic level sensors that are radio enabled and they, they sense the water level upstream and downstream of the gate and the gate position and radio that information back to SWIMS communication hub, which you see in the photo just above. And we had to do that in this case by radio. We would prefer to do a wired sensor, but we had to do that by radio to uh, keep everything clean on the district side, stay out of the way of their operation and maintenance activities. and we kept the pole and the communication only on the farmers, uh, near the farmer's head, as you can see there. On the right, you see a tailwater sensor where we have logging tailwater, monitoring tailwater as it goes over weir into a drainage box. And that also is communicated by radio back to the central hub. And then on the left side is a weather station we installed in Prill Valley in an alfalfa field that monitors all of the components necessary for calculating reference evapotranspiration. And through all that, we're able to close the water balance on the fields on which we're monitoring with each of those components, delivery, tailwater, NET. Um, also, we're able to monitor soil moisture. Haven't done that under the Imperial Valley field throughout the season, although we will monitor soil moisture at the beginning of the end of the season to close the water budget. Next slide, please. Our other pilot area here is in California Central Valley, specifically the Southern San Joaquin Valley. A uh, little bit different conditions in the Imperial Valley. Here we see uh, a good portion of the water applied to fields there is withdrawn from groundwater, but also is supplemented with surface irrigation from districts. So in the lower right corner, you see a filter station that has a, a propeller type meter on it. We, that was an existing meter. We were able to just tap into that existing meter, tie that into our system, and bring it into the SWIM server and monitor that data in near real time. Just above that, on the upper right of that photo, you see a similar situation where we're tapping into an existing electromagnetic flow meter and from a groundwater well and bringing that into the SLIM server as well. So there we have on-flow or uh, supply water monitored 
in two different ways. And then uh, the photo to the left is a, just an inset of the groundwater well to magmeter. Overall, the, the water balance in this area is near Arvin, California, uh, is a little bit different because cell water is, is not as critical there. Most of the cell water uh, stays on the field. If it does collect at all, it either percolates quickly or is used on the same field or an adjacent field. So it, it doesn't leave the system for our purposes of our, our water balance. And we only are concerned about monitoring on flows and differentiating those uh, delivery flows, whether they be from groundwater or surface water. And if they're blended, we monitor each of the components of the blend and calculate a pro rata share applied to the field throughout the season. Also should mention that where there are groundwater concerns in this area, we're monitoring groundwater level at various points. Uh, next slide, please. Palo Verde Valley. That happens to be where I am today, joining you from beautiful Blythe, California. Our pilot projects there so far consist primarily of monitoring delivery to farm fields from the irrigation district here. And it's been a little bit challenging in, in some ways in that we're monitoring the delivered water in the farm ditches and not at the head gate. Notice in the lower central picture there was a prototype we put together to be able to monitor on the head gate. But we ultimately ended up putting things in the in the farm ditches. You see in the lower right an existing broad crest of weir that had been in place and that happens to be on an adjacent farm where we're not monitoring, but that's one that would be fairly easy for swim to instrument and monitor. And then the the wooden flume you see above that is one a temporary device we've installed recently. Uh, notice that's a pretty good size flume. It's about eight feet across and carries thirty five cubic feet per second. Uh, that's one that we are monitoring currently. And just getting this project off the ground will be expanding that to another fourteen or fifteen sites in the coming weeks here. Again, primarily this is a project about uh, monitoring inflows from the irrigation district, but we're also looking at the possibility of monitoring tailwater and adding a weather station and remote sensing for calculating ET. Next slide, please. Finally, just from the perspective of an irrigation engineer, what the benefits of SWIM are to growers or water managers. As Kevin already mentioned, we're able to optimize the water budget, and I, I find that useful for planning. If you're uh, limited to a, a given allocation for water supply, of course you need to optimize how you're going to use that, which components are best served for which crops, and where there may be extra to, to lease or to, to provide to a competing use, or where you may need to acquire more. That allows you to analyze your your whole operation and decide where best management practices are currently currently being employed and where there may be room for improvement. And giving a, having a holistic view of the water balance allows you to really break that down and see what can be done. It allows you to also demonstrate your efficient use of water. If you're already very efficient, swim can monitor the flow pass and demonstrate that to anybody who needs to see it, to document the water use baseline uh, prior to any improvements or after improvements, depending on the situation. Also verify any conservation that you're involved in. So that, that's kind of the, the sum of the previous two points. You're able to document your baseline and demonstrate an improvement upon it. Be able to document conservation, which may be necessary depending on what you intend to do with that conserved water. And finally, easing the pressure on regional water supplies. If, if you're able to apply SWIM in all of these ways, uh, maximize your use of the water and free up any water for other uses if possible. It, it allows you to have a holistic view of, of water use on your operation if, if many operators are using the same same technology. It allows for system-wide planning and overall improved 
management of the water supply. And with that, I thank you for listening and turn it back to Kevin. Thank you, Darren. I appreciate that. If you don't mind, stick around here as questions come in so that we can so that we can go ahead and answer them. I'll uh, I'll wrap this up by uh, reminding everyone kind of the tagline that I use uh, when I when I'm talking to growers for the first time about swim. Some of you may have heard this before. Some of you it will be new. But you know, I ask this this rhetorical question. I say, you know. You as a grower, and, and I will say this, the majority of our staff come from ag backgrounds. So we either own farms, we own water rights, we have, some of us own both, some of us own neither, depending on the situation. Uh, but we all come from an ag background. And the one thing, when I think about the discussions I've had with a multitude of growers in three states now, I ask this rhetorical question. I say, you know, you spend money to balance your finances and protect every drop of money that's coming into your financial account. You spend money on attorneys sometimes, agronomic specialists, organic specialists, you name it, uh, to make sure that your operation is protected. Shouldn't you at least spend a part of that same amount of, of uh, cost on managing your most valuable water right, or your most valuable right and asset, which is that water right, especially in times of drought. Uh, but even past this drought, the, the drought is exacerbating the situation. It is certainly not going to go away with with uh, with the ceasing of the drop when 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 and if that actually happens so this is something that we really encourage people to get a hope get in front of and start auditing those water rights making sure that data in your pocket if it goes nowhere else but your own pocket is somewhat of an insurance policy by itself so with that I thank everyone for the uh, for the formal part of the presentation for listening and I'll turn it back over to Lisa now to uh, to take Q&A. Lisa? Yeah, thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have folks here live in Salinas uh, who, if you have any questions, any questions here from the audience, we'll ask Kevin to repeat the question if, if you have one. Seeing, um, I see one question here that came in. Um, how does the producer receive the data from you? Good question. Very good question. So uh, in this day and age, a printed report doesn't buy you much, right? You can go, for, you can go kill another tree. Everything comes in through the cloud. Uh, so that data is, is, I'll back up. So that data is very much encrypted. It's protected. And it's anonymized. That's the other thing. So when we enter into a contract with a, with a grower, and I'll get to the, the, the answer to the question here in a minute, but when we enter into a, a contract with a grower, that data is, is protected from it. The grower has to tell us that they want the water district to get that data. The water district then in turn needs to let us know if any other party gets the aggregated data. But the only one that gets it is that is that particular grower. So the grower can access it online. Uh, we have a report uh, development engine that can email the report. You can get them through basically all the methods that you, that you get most of your data. You can get them through the web. You can get them through uh, email reports. In most cases, the majority of our growers will just take periodic reports. They're not looking for daily data. Even though this is near real-time information, uh, most of the folks are looking for flow data once a day or once a week and a balanced crop water budget at the end of the crop or the end of the season. However, we do have those clients, and, and we, so we've developed tools that can pull that data directly to your computer in a pull fashion and in a very uh, protected method. We've also set it up so that you can access it through a portal. You can also access it here in the new version of Swim Manager that's coming out here at the very very beginning of the year. So it's actually embedded into that program. But we have to be very careful because obviously that data is very proprietary and the, the protection of that data is probably our highest concern. So we're very careful on how we process it. Yeah. I think that's a key issue for, for everyone at stake here. Uh, another submitted question here. What information do you need initially for a grower to use swim monitoring on a field or field? That's a great question, and I'm going to turn that over to Darren if he's still on the line because uh, that's his that's his area of expertise. Darren, do you want to go ahead and take it? Where we usually start there is me with the grower determine the scope of his operation, which field it is, what he farms, what his crop rotation is, and once we've extracted that information, I get out and walk the fields, find out how water arrives at each field and where it goes. So the principal information we need up front, we obtain through an interview. And it, 
it's basic information most growers know off the top of their head or can easily access. And then the, the field information our technical staff acquires with boots on the ground. You know, Darren, I'm going to add to that as well. So we have these fancy programs. Uh, we find that our growers, after they go through this process once, are much more able to use the platform, or much more comfortable, maybe is a better way to put it, uh, on their own. So we have varying, as you can imagine, we have varying degrees of technical competency uh, amongst uh, our, our clients. You know, some of them just don't want to deal with, with programming. They just they want us to do it all. And of course, we have a staff that, that is at their beck and call to handle that. Then we have the growers that want to keep all of that data within their office. They have an operating staff. They would rather be trained on the platform once and then utilize it themselves. So since our job is to provide the service to our client in our best, best possible way, uh, we give the other clients the option on how they want to handle it. But in all cases, especially at this point, uh, especially since we've been going to so many new regions, Darren and his staff walk those fields because we can't afford to have a misstep in our data analytics right now. Uh, people are relying on that information to make very serious decisions. In some cases, they get a new revenue, revenue stream from that data. So it's very important to us to make sure that that data is tip-top shape. It's been quality checked two, three, in some cases four times before it goes to the client. Just to make sure, because when we put that swim, swim stamp of approval, that certification on it, it means something to us. Got it. Got it. Kevin, okay, thanks so. for the added clarification on that. I, I would also mm -hmm. add there that swim planner can easily be used by growers. But we find it's easiest if we meet with them individually first and help them load all the information into it and give them guided uh, tutorial there on how to use it. From there, they, they're they happy going ahead. Absolutely. And we prefer it that way because if our client, especially at this stage, not that it never, never it will always matter <laughs> for us as we grow, but at this stage, it's a new program. This isn't something just right out the gate that we developed in someone's garage. It took us five years to develop the process. And it took a lot of competencies outside even my simple competency to develop. So with the complexities of the technology package, the worst thing we're going to have is someone trip. Now, we do have a, 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 a sample version of the program on our website, the planner tool. I think it's actually key for Imperial Valley. Uh, when folks use it, they oftentimes will fiddle with it a little bit and then call us up with questions. Some of them will turn it on. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we'll go to our nine-year-old and ten-year-old staff base uh, and ask them to fix it. They'll look at you for five minutes, roll their eyes, and give it back to you, and it starts working. Right? That's, that's what the kids of the day are able to do. <laughs> but, but, for, but in all seriousness, when we deploy, when we first get the technology out into the hands of a new client, we just want to make sure that they're using it properly because good data in, good data out, and you know we're, we're selling our name and our reputation, and it's on the line every time we deploy SWIM, so that's very important. Go ahead, Darren. Sorry if you wanted to add anything to that. We have, another, we have another question, and, and uh, it, it's got a good lead in. It says, uh, not all ditches are the same. <laughs> How do you take this into consideration? In some cases, they're not even ditches, right, Darren? That's absolutely right. We monitor water in pipelines, in open channels, uh, through the soil profile. It, there are a lot of variations. You know, so the, to re answer the question on how we re respond to that, how we analyze each ditch is, again, kicking dirt boots in the field. We have to have a look at each water source and determine how best to monitor that water source. I'm going to add to that because we've done enough deployments now here in a couple of different regions, in a couple of different states. And the one thing that strikes me uh, every time we go to a new region, you would think that if water is developed, or I'm sorry, uh, if water is uh, just delivered in a, uh, in a channel, let's say it's an open channel, whether it's lined or not for a moment, you would think you could use the same package in each and every one of those channels. But there's such... There's such idiosyncrasies in each of these regions we enter, and that's another. You have to have a very broad competency, and that, that's why we're not an equipment manufacturer. We use multiple equipment manufacturers to get a solution put in place because there's not just one transducer, one flow sensor, one piece of this, one piece of that widget that will work. And and our team has decades of experience doing this. So when we go to a new region, we run into some challenges, but we can very quickly 
get a solution that makes the client happy, the grower happy, the irrigation district happy in most cases. And, and that's the biggest challenge. So not all ditches, whether they're lined or unlined, are created equal. Not all pipes are created equal. And let's not forget that most growers, not all, but most growers have multiple sources of water on one field. Some might be pulling groundwater, might have state compliance requirements. I have to use SIGMA as an example here out in California, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Some of their water might come from a district source, which might be surface flow piped in. Some may have three sources. Some may have no sources. Some may have one. And so you get into, if you're going to account for every drop, you've got to take that into account. And then when the water gets onto the field, we're dealing with, with crop assumptions, consumption uh, data, et cetera, et cetera, to close that crop water budget. So think about water on the field, water going off the field, up and down. It's a, it's a challenging uh, combination. Uh, when you look at that combination total, it's a challenging process. Well, but, that, that, but we're good at it. That's, so we, uh, we like it. That addresses what someone's question. So do you use different methods to monitor when you have you know, multiple sources of water? We do. We absolutely do. And the, each of those methods are, are normally or always calibrated against another source. When we put sensors out in the field, we don't just throw sensors out in the field, give you access to a software program and say, here's your data, it's on the cloud, go get it and try to figure it out. That's what, by and large, most, most whether it's flow data in the field, whether it's soil moisture, whether it's climatic data, whether it's remote sense data, that's basically, in most cases, what you get. And it's a piece of the puzzle. So think about you're putting this 100 piece puzzle together and you're getting a little bit of, a couple of pieces here, a couple of pieces there, but you've got holes in the puzzle. Unless you're gathering all that data and processing it real time and calibrating that data, it, I mean, crud in, crud out. My mother always said that, and that holds true today. Crud in, she said crap, but this is a PG-13. Crud in and crud out. So you got to get good data going in, good data going out. And each of those sources of flow, we calibrate. Darren, do you want to add to that a little bit on how we calibrate those sensors? I think I'd give an example of some different conditions we've come across. Just in the Southeast California region, our pilot project in the Imperial Valley, uh, the Imperial Irrigation District was kind enough to allow us to install sensors directly on their head gates and essentially duplicate what their ditch riders do and by monitoring in real time by measuring upstream and downstream and uh, calibrating that slide gate and the head loss across that gate to calculate flow. In the Palo Verde Valley, a uh, different scenario, we are working in the farmer's ditch, as I mentioned before, and they're very flat ditches, and they carry a lot of water. And so we're, we are using water measurement structures, flumes and weirs, but they are almost always submerged because of the very small slope in the ditches. So again, very, very different scenario in both cases. And to answer your question, Kevin, we don't just put the flume out there and hope that it produces the right data. We have a secondary source to check that. We're using Doppler meters in the ditch also to verify the calibration of those structures. Same thing in the Imperial Valley, also verifying the calibration of the uh, sluice gates with Doppler Darren, meters. And Darren, I'll add to that on the climatic data. We normally don't just pull one source of climatic data. A lot, a lot of groups will go to CMIS in California. We have something similar to that in Colorado called AGMET. You know, the public services, they'll pull that data, treat it as gospel, and then when you go and process it, you wonder why the, why, why the numbers don't add up, right? I mean, I, I, I'm saying that sarcastically because we know why it doesn't. Some, some of that data is missing. Sometimes it's not calibrated data. Uh, the, the reasons go on and on and on. So we are cross-referencing multiple sources of data and then going one level beyond that and looking at remote sense data and cross-referencing against certain data streams. It's a pri proprietary process that we've developed, although we share it with our clients, and all of them nod their head and say that's a pretty good way. So what that, that ends up uh, allowing is if you have a breakdown in the data, you're missing some, some form of data, you've got a backup source to get it. If you have holes in your data stream and you're trying to, kind of like trying to balance your checkbook and having seven or eight days worth of debit card uh, transactions done and you can't, can't balance your checkbook. Same idea. So we have a question here uh, for, through the webinar. How does SWIM keep pace with advances in remote and in situ sensing technology and how does SWIM compete or not with current water conservation startups? 
Um, <laughs> Darren, you want to? I'll, I'll give you a quick overview. So as far as competition, I'll go back to that. Should I just go back to this slide here? Can we still on the screen? Mm -hmm. I'm going to pop back to this slide just as a refresher. So when you look at the other folks that are out there, let's spend a little more time on this slide here. There's lots of companies out there that are widget manufacturers that make point of, of, of space measurements. Uh, we use some of them. We use some of the ones that have been around for a long time that our team is comfortable with their calibration and their accuracy, uh, but we don't use a lot of them. We have a, a handful of them that we're comfortable with. Sometimes we have to go out to the field and, and actually uh, you know, retrofit units if, they're, if, they're, if we know that they're calibrated and they're solid. Uh, but all of those folks are down here. They're getting, you know, look down here on my little, my little chart here. You get one point of measurement, more than one point, a couple points of measurement. So that, that, that's, again, the folks that we're competing against are equipment manufacturers, remote sensing, service providers, and consulting engineers that are doing like baseline, you know, large scale analysis. Most, most of the folks that are doing large base, baselines, they're not using in the field data like what we're producing. They're using much larger um, assumptions, a lot of assumptions, and with assumptions comes inaccuracy. And if you're tracking every drop, you obviously can't do that with an assumption. Uh, remote sensing companies, we use remote sensing, but we use other data to, to cross-reference and check. So again, there's folks that are playing in elements of the space, but no one has brought it up into this holistic, scalable, field level to system-wide basis, and it's developed a system uh, that's cost-effective for the grower. So I think that hopefully answers the competition question. And I apologize. What was the, the other part of the question? Uh, well, it was about uh, competing or not with current water conservation startups, and then how do you keep pace with the advances? We are, you heard of education. That's basically what the business we're in. So we have relationships with universities, the federal government. We've, we've utilized those to, uh, to successful ends on many research projects. As a matter of fact, the whole underlying research project of five years from the very beginning that we spoke about earlier in the presentation has led up to the evolution of SWIM. Ongoing, we have initiatives moving forward where we continue to, uh, you have to stay in front of the, of the curve, basically, is the answer to that question. Darren, do you want, I, and I, I was going to offer Darren for you to go ahead and expound on that and fill in any holes I might have missed. I would add to that that, yes, the ag tech field is certainly growing in leaps and bounds and advancing quickly. And to stay ahead of that, we really have to keep our ear to the ground for new advances. A lot of our technical staff have personal relationships with some of the foremost researchers in agriculture and water resources in addition to uh, memberships in the trade organizations and just keeping our ear to the ground making sure we're not missing any developments is really important to keep our staff tipped up. And to close that question out, I'll tell you how else we do it is we get our, we get our feet dirty. Uh, example, one of, one of the sites that Darren was working on in Palo Verde, we couldn't get a sensor to give us the data if we wanted to for the life of us. It was a really challenging deployment. We had done multiple lined and unlined ditches up to this point. This was in our first rodeo. Darren got into our, his swim truck and drove to Yuma, drove to here and back, and got a solution. So as we do. We don't talk, we do. And that sep separates us from others, I believe. So I have a follow-up. It looks like two different uh, people have come in with the same uh, notion here. So does SWIM work economically for any farm, or is there a minimum acreage limit? You know, um, it's a good question. So we, we've looked at this. It, it, it works for all sizes of farms. The question you get into is you get to these you get to these points of diminished returns where if you're on a you know 50 acre field and that's all you're doing, um, can you save enough water to make it economically viable? There's you know there, there's obviously a uh, you know there's a baseline cost into the system. Starting in 2017, we have a package that we're going to be offering that includes long-term lease arrangements and actually bundles the limited equipment. We use very little equipment to get this data. It would, it would boggle your mind to see the level of equipment that we use to get this accurate crop water budget data. And it took us five years to figure out the right, right mix. We just didn't wake up with it one day and say this is the way to go. But now that we've got a, a line on, on the best way to get good quality data at a relatively low cost per acre, now our job has been to uh, spread, we look to spread those costs over multi-year contracts. 
just like when you buy your cell phone, just like when you buy satellite or cable service or you buy a car, you buy anything that has a capital expense, if you try to pay it off in one year, it's going to be a high payment. You're not going to be able to, including cell phone. You can't see your cell phone outside your two-year contract you end up, or your iPhone. You end up paying them five, seven, eight hundred bucks. That's the cost of the, the equipment. So as long as you stay on to a quote-unquote, you know, they call them long-term contracts. Our contracts are now going to start running two, three, four, five years in duration. Some are, of our clients are asking for 10-year contracts. All of a sudden, now the cost goes way down. And now those lower acreages can afford swim where, I'll be honest with you, we wouldn't do a deployment site up to this point that's less than 200 acres, maybe 150, 200 acres up to this point. Over time now, the cost is, is getting a little more manageable as long as someone's willing to go out a little bit longer. But the larger the, the, the operations, the better off uh, you're going to be. And most of our clients right now are large-scale corporate growers, uh, large-scale family growers, although we do have a couple of smaller farmers that are monetizing the system as well. Darren, do you want to add anything to that? Feel free. Or correct? Well, I won't go so far as to say that's a loaded question, but I will say any producers in the room know that there are a lot of variables that go into considering whether or not a certain ag operation is going to be viable. And it can be viable on a very small acreage if you're talking about a high-value crop. Similarly with water as an asset. If you have a very high-value asset in, in your water, it really doesn't matter if you're looking at a small amount of water or a large amount of water. If it's valuable, it's worth protecting and worth maximizing. That's, that's even more eloquently put than I, than I did, Darren, to be perfectly blunt. You know? That's I mean, first. That's well, uh, take it where you can get it. Um, so here's a kind of technical. Um, what patents are involved? Uh, is there licensing? Licensing. So we have we have the patent on the process at SWIM. So we don't we don't actually issue a license uh, to to anyone. We we're just we have the ability to do it because we have the patent on it. It was co-developed uh, with the USDA, so they are a co-inventor of the primary. Uh, patent took us about three or four years to get it through the system. We now have additional patents pending on processes that we further develop from this called, I guess, a parent patent, for lack of a better word. But the way we offer our service is simple, per, a cost per acre uh, per year, depending on the services that you're taking, uh, and it ranges from very, very low in the teens per acre per year, all the way, up, and, it, and it goes up from there, depending on what you add to it. Uh, in a couple of cases, we we do do some revenue shares uh, on our contracts. So we have a couple of different contra contracting methods, but they're they're service-based contracts. Uh, they're not we're not sub-licensing the patent or anything like that. I hope that answers that question. Well, I think that wraps up our questions from the audience, uh, both live and on the webinar, and those that were sent in via email. So I just wanted to uh, ask Kevin, do you want to, or Darren, do you want to? Wrap anything up? Is there anything else you want to add to close us out? You know, um, I can't thank Western Growers enough for their support, uh, both here at the webinar and just the work that you guys have done to help us get our message across. You know, it took us two years to build this relationship to where it is now with Western Growers, where we have a formal definitive agreement that we're offering, and they spent a lot of time looking under the hood, so to speak. So to me, it's an honor to have them uh, and be able to mention them as a true strategic partner. Uh, I thank you, Lisa, for getting this set up. This has been a wonderful opportunity. Beautiful day in Salinas. And appreciate everyone here in the room that, uh, that joined in person. And, of course, everyone here in webinar land for joining. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Darren, thank you for joining. Do you have anything to add? I'd only say that it's been a real pleasure getting to know Western Grower members in various regions. They've been very gracious, taking us on to their farms and showing us how water moves in their operations. I look forward to meeting more. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. We're signing off. Thanks again.